So for my students, uh, one of the things that I try to do is I try to give them a timeline of what to study and how to study it and what the name or period names are. And you can visit my site if you want to, to to get this off of there and you can figure out what the passwords are if you actually look at the syllabi there in the passwords. So if you want to get in there and take a look at that stuff. But uh, again, I want to comment that if you're looking at this and, and you're using these dates, other teachers might not be into it. Okay. So if you look at this timeline, one of the things that I'm trying to point out is that a lot of the cultures are grouped around the same time periods and a lot of geographic regions are grouped around the same time periods. Like, so uh, an interesting kind of undetail is uh, the Cyclades are around 2500 and that's contemporary contemporaneous with the building of the pyramids. The Minoan culture at Crete is 1500, so are the mainland. And then we're going to move into some later works of art. So when we looked at Lefkandi, the site was about 1000, but the artwork sort of looked geometric or proto-geometric. And there are some sub-styles of pottery that we're going to be studying that exist in Aegean art, specifically on the mainland in the Helladic cultures. And that's what we're going to be studying next. And so the question is, why bother with pottery? Okay. Well, if you look at my pottery <laughs> from my house, you'll see with my cute little Ernie cup, I have a series of pots that I know these vessels, what is specifically in each one. And so I know what to find in each one of these vessels in order to get what I want to eat and what is appropriate for each thing. Now, the other thing about, for instance, my pottery or vessels is that they communicate some things about the kinds of things I'm into personally, but also what the culture is into, right? So when you study pottery, pottery is is sometimes considered a low art. It's not high art. It's a popular art. It's popular culture. And so the imagery on it often communicates exactly what the culture believed in and what kinds of values they had. Ancient Greek vessels all have names that are specifically about what each vessel was used for. So, for instance, the amphora, it, amphora means to carry and it has two handles on it. You have a panathenaic amphora, which is basically a kind of form in which you have, uh, it's, it's an amphora, two handles on it, but it has all of Athens used it. Pan meaning all, athenaic means Athens. Hydria, water, oinokoi means I think to pour out. A crater is a big vessel that's used to have uh, mix wine and water in. And of course the bell crater looks like a bell. Uh, calyx crater or kylix crater looks almost like a cross between one of their drinking cups, which is a kylix. And then you have these other little vessels, you know, that are, that are used to pour things out and that kind of thing. So the decorations on pottery, for instance, this plate tells you something about America. You know, uh, we value country scenes and we, we value landscape and plants and animals and that kind of thing. And you could go a little bit deeper. It's kind of a kitsch kind of plate with a country kind of theme on it. It's got these wheels on it with, with a waterfall and all of those things relate to the good old fashioned values, sort of like little house on the prairie. That's what this plate kind of represents, at least to me. And maybe if an archeologist dug through my house, um, they would think the same kinds of things. When we were studying the art from Crete and from the island cultures of the Minoan cultures, we noticed that water is one of those things that's depicted in the same way across various different cultures. And some of the things that we discussed, for instance, was the idea that even though there was a desert culture of the Anasazi people, they still maintained or made vessels that had water on them because water is an important thing in our cultures. And so the marine themes that we see throughout the Minoan culture relate directly to their environment and to sort of enjoying the environment. And there are tons of octopi jugs uh, throughout the Minoan culture. You can actually just Google it and see how many different ones you can come up with. Just type in octopus and, and Crete and see what happens. So for archaeologists and art historians, a main thing to know is what the vessels hold and what they represent. And that way you will know 
on a test, <laughs> if you know that something that has two handles, it's an amphora. If you know that it has, um, it, it's a sort of shallow bowl that we see represented here, that's a kylix. I've also heard it pronounced calyx. And uh, that means to roll out, and that's from the use of the, the potter's wheel. And then the oinokoi is basically a pitcher or a vessel that pours things out. So we know specifically those are the main kinds of vessels that we're going to look at, and they become a standard kind of form, almost like jelly jars and Tabasco jars and things like that. The first period we're going to be studying is the geometric period, and it goes from about 900 to 700, and if you looked at that timeline before, it does overlap with the sculpture style that is archaic style sculpture or archaic period. And so when you're studying art history, sometimes periods and, and styles are one and the same thing, and art historians use that interchangeably. This. Uh, crater is actually one that was found in Athens in the cemetery, in the in the Diplion Cemetery, but it now lives in the Metropolitan Museum of New York. And so when my wife and I, here she is on the right hand side, uh, is posing next to it to give you a sense of scale, we got to see this. And it was one of those things I was so excited when I was studying art history and I got to see this the first time. And it's called geometric because it's stylized in a geometric way. So let's look at it first from a formal point of view and then discuss the iconography or symbolism on the vase afterwards. From a for formal point of view, this is a pretty big vase. It's humongous. It's made out of terracotta and it was glazed with on gobe or slip, which is just a dark um, glaze that would have darkened or oxidized in the heat of a kiln. The size, although it's massive, it's completely decorated and probably the way that this was decorated was it was placed on a wheel so that, for instance, those long horizontal lines that you're looking at could have been actually just the potter just holds the brush in one spot and then just spins the wheel and puts the glaze on it in that single swoop that runs around it. It's organized or divided up into a series of frets or horizontal bands, and that's important because every single section of this is filled up, and the horizontal bands actually contain decorative motifs and stories. If we zoom in on some of the areas, you'll see that they leave no space untouched. And again, that term for that, the art historical term for that, is horror vacui, which means a fear of empty spaces. The figures themselves and all of the ornamentation in it are completely stylized in a geometric way and they look a little bit like those Cycladic figures that we saw from the Cycladic islands and they are not very naturalistic. Now look at the date, it's 750 BCE and the Minoan culture for instance, the Vafio cups and other things we looked at are really 1500 BCE. So what happened? Why is this more stylized? Well, it's a different culture. It's a different time period and they have different ideas and values. And in this instance, it was more about communicating clearly the themes on the vessel and what it was used for. So let's go into context slightly. The context that this was found in was a cemetery, and this might have been placed on top of a grave. I understand that there are actually holes in the base of it, and the holes were described by my professor Herbert Broderick that they could have been drainage holes, or they could have been that you put libations, like for instance, pour wine in it, and then the wine trickles down through the bottom of the vase into the grave. And this relates somewhat to scenes out of the Odyssey where they bring libations of blood, or you can you can pour wine on someone's grave to sort of feed them after their death. Dead. So we know that this is a grave marker, it's sort of a tombstone. And when we zoom in on the central section of this, you can actually see there are people surrounding a funeral beer. I think beer is spelled B-I-E-R in this instance. And there's a man sitting on the funeral beer, and you can tell that it's a male because he has a penis coming out of the side of his thigh. And then you can see the mother and son in various locations on this. One is they're seated. The other one is that they're on the funeral bier themselves. And then underneath the funeral bier is actually a series of animals and uh, um, ducks and birds and things like that. And those probably were to be buried with him. I understand. I think that they burnt the bodies, but I'm not completely sure about this. On either side of the funeral bier, what you see are these, pe these figures with their hands above their heads. They're actually women pulling out their hair. So they are mourning the death of this hero who was buried in this cemetery. And that's a standard iconography or a standard read of this kind of symbols or iconography.
the vessel is you can you can walk completely around it and it has the it's an amphora it has several handles it's not officially an amphora because it has two handles it's actually the design is called a crater but you can actually see in the bottom registers there's actually a parade for the fallen hero as well so when you zoom in on that you can actually see some of the figures are uh, chariots with the uh, with soldiers who are carrying shields on them as well That iconography is fairly consistent, and you can see that another vase found from the same time period in the same cemetery yields the same kind of completely decorated horror vacui divided up into frets. This one doesn't have the, the uh, funeral procession or the parade in honor of the person, but it does have a central panel. And the central panel we're looking at has the same theme on it. It has the funeral beer. It has the people pulling their hair out. It has people uh, surrounding this person. And it also has the same design of what's called a Greek key above it, which is that sort of weird spiraling pattern that you're going to see on buildings later on. So if we go down the vase, you can actually see a lot of the patterns are repeated over and over again, that it's, it's a way of just filling in the form. And I think that for a lot of cultures, the idea of decorating something and really having it almost over the top decoration is a way of showing extra work and extra attention to the work. And in that way, the decorative qualities of these geometric forms and, and the horror vacui is a way of also showing that this is a prestige item. It's, a, it's an item worth a lot. It's, a, it's something that's valuable by all the work that went into it. Now, there's a shift from the geometric period or, or uh, geometricizing style, which is basically the forms are in black figures that are painted almost as silhouettes on a vase. And then we have a little shift into what's called the orientalizing period. And we're looking at an oinokoi, which is just basically a wine pitcher. And you can see it almost seems like it's influenced a little bit by the artwork that we saw, um, for instance, in Mesopotamia. Uh, it has these sort of griffin lions on it. It almost looks Egyptian to some of the forms on it. We have little swastika designs on it. What distinguishes this vase from the geometric style vase that we're looking at on the right hand side probably is that the figures are very curvilinear they're naturalistic in some ways they're still cartoons there's no deep space and they still kind of have that horror vacui with these little doodads or medallions that are floating around them but we still have we have a figure that is flowing a little bit more and the other thing is it's a little bit like for instance asian art where we have this line and fill uh, pattern that we saw, for instance, in the, uh, the, the earlier banners we looked at from Lady Di's banner and, and the, the other banner of the magician flying into the sky. We've got an outline, which is a contour line that outlines it and then fill in of the, of the color. And so these aren't strictly black figures anymore. They're actually kind of outlined figures and there are different colors of glaze. In the bottom register, what we see is actually plants that look like they are Egyptian in origin. And I think that those are either papyrus or lotus blossoms in the bottom register, which also indicates that it's orientalized. And when we talked about orientalizing styles, it's basically a cheesy term that art historians came up with to describe anything that looks like it's influenced by something from the East. And in this instance, it would be something that's influenced by the Eastern culture of the Egyptians. Now, the last thing about the iconography, we have a griffin, which is a chimera, which is a composite or compound creature of a lion and an, an eagle. And then in the second middle register, we have another hunting scene that relates to the scene that we saw from Tyrene's and also from the flotilla fresco of the Aegean Sea uh, from Thera, in which you have a hunting scene, which is a sort of standard kind of theme in a lot of artwork, this, this hunting scene. There's an evolution in the orientalizing period that also starts to show human figures or, or uh, anthropomorphic figures a little bit more realistically. And this vase, I've heard it called a whole bunch of different things. In most textbooks, they call it the blinding of Polyphemus and, and Gorgons. I've also once or twice heard it called the Ulysses vase and was found at a place called Eloisis. And so I think the Eloisis amphora and what is really significant for me is that 
there's actually an artist associated with it. And the artist's name is Menelaus. And so we actually have a real artist who signed their work. And that also means that people are starting to become literate and they're taking pride and there's a, a rise in individual individuality. And, um, we haven't actually seen this since Thutmose in Egypt, where we actually know the name of the artist. So you can see it's done in a very similar style. It's, it's, um, again, it's divided up into frets and bands, kind of like the Oinokoi on the left. We also have, um, a series of successive stories in the middle register. There's a hunting scene with a series of boars, uh, fighting. And then the top, the top and bottom levels actually depict different stories. The top level uh, is a story out of the story of the Odyssey, which is um, it's actually when uh, Ulysses or Odysseus is returning home and he has to blind the the Cyclops. The bottom register actually is a depiction of a scene from a story concerning Perseus and the Gorgons. So zooming in on this, we see, first of all, that there is, again, horror vacui, and they're putting these sort of weird little medallions and, and doodads in areas between the figures. But most significantly, it shows a story. And you know how kids have a hero lunchbox that depicts, for instance, Batman or Superman, or if it's a female, it's, it's some other characters that, that they're into. Well, this is kind of what the Greeks <laughs> were into and the stories that they were into. So, for instance, the story of Odysseus is that he is trying to get back home and he spends many years trying to return home. And at one point, he ends up on an island. And the island is an island that contains this giant creature that has only one eye. And that is a metaphor for actually people who are not hospitable and people who are not human. And this sort of creature that is the offspring of Poseidon and a, and a, uh, and someone else I can't remember who at the moment is he has this cave and the laws or rules of hospitality are that if someone is lost and traveling, you want to make them your friend. You want to make them your buddy. So you greet them with open arms and you give them food and, and shelter. Well, Odysseus assumes that that's going to be the case. He ends up in this cave and he doesn't really understand that the Cyclops lives there. And then the Cyclops comes in and rolls a stone in front of the door. And he's so big that Odysseus's crew can't move the stone. And so the Cyclops is, starts eating them. And in a nutshell, there, uh, Odysseus steps up and introduces himself to the Cyclops and says, if you eat me, you'll eat all the magic in my brains, in my head, and, and you won't have learned anything. And so he convinces the Cyclops to have a drink with him. And they pour out wine, and Cyclops has never had wine before. And the Cyclops gets drunk. And when he's passed out, Odysseus takes a a uh, spear more or less and jams it into the eye of the cyclops and this is that that's what this scene depicts he got the cyclops drunk he he blinds him and then what they do to get out of the cave is actually the men either attach themselves to the bodies of sheep underneath they crawl underneath or they also put on sheepskin and when the cyclops rolls back the stone they sneak out of the cave uh underneath the sheep or underneath sheepskin to to escape the cyclops and Odysseus introduces himself to the Cyclops. His name is No Badi. And so when the Cyclops starts to yell for his brothers, um, you know, he says, he blinded me, he blinded me. And they go, who blinded you? He says, nobody blinded me. And so, of course, they escape. And so this is one of those episodes. And I think the most important component of this is that it shows a hero who also uses his brains. He's intelligent. And that was one of the qualities that would have been important in Greek armies. And, in, and the ancient Greeks actually prized intellectuality and cleverness. And a lot of the stories from the Iliad and the Odyssey express those kinds of ideas. Now, the other thing that I want to point out is that this is a transference of cultural stories and transference of cultural values, but it also shows an evolution in formal kinds of components. We see here that there's an outline kind of effect going on and that the figures are not black figured silhouettes completely, that there is white glaze being used in certain areas of this phase as well. In the register below, you actually see a sort of hunting scene, a boar scene, where these animals are fighting, and that relates to other scenes that we've seen on other vases and other frescoes from the Minoan period.
then in the bottom register, you see these sort of weird creatures. And these creatures have snakes for hair. I guess they needed some really good cream rinse. And the story that's probably depicted on this, if you look on the right-hand side, you can see some legs walking away, is the story of Perseus and the Gorgons. And more or less, the, the story is this, that the Gorgons were so ugly that um, you, if you looked on them, they would turn to stone. And Perseus is fighting another army. And so what he does is he actually cuts the head off of one of these Gorgons who has snakes for hair and then puts it in a sack and then he instructs his men not to look and so when his men actually uh, are fighting this army he at one point he gives a signal they all avert their eyes Perseus stands up there uh, with this this head of the Gorgon and uh, and turns the opposing army into stone now you're probably wondering well how did he cut the head off, right? You know, because if, if he looked at it, it would turn to stone. The way he did it was he shined up a shield and he looked into the shield and he saw a distorted reflection, which didn't turn him to stone. And so I think that, again, this is a hero who's using intellect over, over strength. Um, and there's, it kind of relates somewhat to the idea of the centaur that the brain and the intellect are prime to becoming a hero and that physical strength are a secondary concern. And, and I think that's something that we can learn from in our own culture. There's another vase that is extremely significant and it's named after who found it, this guy named Francois. And Let's start from a contextual point of view about um, why this vase is studied. Well, first of all, it was found pretty complete. It has a series of stories on it. It was, I think it was actually found in Italy. I'm not sure. I don't think it was actually found in Greece. So we know that probably these were export items. And the other thing that I think is significant, it's signed in two places, Clytus, the painter, and Ergotimus, the potter. So we've got a division of labor, and we've got this sort of idea that there are these divisions between the workmen and the painters. The style of this, you can you could look at it from two points of view. Some people call it archaic black figure. It kind of, it's not orientalizing necessarily because it doesn't have this sort of weird curvilinear style, but it is a later vase. If you look at the date 570, it's actually a little bit of a later vase, and you'll see that the figures are more naturalistic than other figures we've looked at, although it still kind of looks like the Aloysius vase in terms of how the figures are painted. It has a bunch of stories on it that relate to Greek values of the time. And so again, I want you to think of this vase kind of as being a reference to ideas that were important to the ancient Greeks and that art is a form of propaganda and in the same way that we give kids comic books and that we have movies about who we think are heroes and who we think are villains, the artwork and stories that we get from ancient Greece communicate these same values. So we've got a whole cast of characters, Apollo, Dionysus, who's also known as Bacchus, Lapiths, which are human, uh, human group of people, the centaurs, and another term, which is the Apollonian-Dionysian conflict. So we've got a bunch of stories here that are, that are kind of important and some terms. We've got a boar hunt on it. Uh, we've got uh, the wedding of Achilles' parents, P Peleus and Thetis. And um, one of the stories on it is the battle between the Lapiths and the Centaurs, which represents what is often referred to as the Apollonian-Dionysian conflict. And it's the battle between the wild and the unwild. Now, I don't want you to think of the battle between the centaurs as a battle between good and evil, because that's not how it was thought of. It was actually uh, thought of as a battle between the rational and intellectual and the battle between the passionate and unreasoning in some ways, which sometimes you need to be unreasoning and sometimes you need to be passionate and sometimes you need to be logical. And so this story and the centaurs kind of represent that. And in a nutshell, the story is... There was a party where the Lapiths invite the centaurs to a wedding. And the during the wedding, the centaurs start drinking. And there's a term called in vino veritas. It's also pronounced in vino veritas. Um, in vino veritas just means in wine is truth. And you probably are aware of this because when you've gone out and gotten drunk with people, sometimes you see more of their true character kind of showing through. And in this instance, the bottom half of the character ran away with them, the stallion or 
or wild horse part that, um, you know, and that's also the sexual part of the person. So in terms of the centaurs, the in Wine is Truth, their true nature came out and they just started basically um, wrecking the party and uh, and forcing themselves sexually on people. And and uh, and there was a battle between these humans who represent rationality and the centaurs who have lost their human part. And so eventually the Lapiths win, which is kind of Apollo in some ways asserting himself, at least through the Lapiths and showing that order must be maintained and is takes over. So this is a theme that comes out comes up throughout ancient Greece, which is the intellect over the physical in a lot of ways, the battle between the uh, Apollonian, the, the intellectual, and the um, Dionysian, which is the passionate and uncontrolled part. This is a theme we see a lot, and uh, I think this is a nice way of showing a transition between how the theme might have been handled in different ways. So the idea of a symposium, you've probably heard of those, is basically an intellectual discussion. Well, they actually believed that symposiums, that if you drank wine, it would free your mind and you would be able to speak more freely and come up with ideas, kind of like how some people have about, uh, you know, absinthe or in the 60s, they used pot and, and, and other drugs for that kind of thing. Um, I, in my opinion, it doesn't really work. But the symposia of, of Athens where they would sit around and drink out of these kylexes, which is this cup labeled B, and they would drink wine and they would become intellectually freed up. And so we see here that the theme of the symposium at the bottom of the wine cup on the right hand side, this is a calyx or kylix. It's an archaic red figure and it shows the battle between the Lapiths and the Centaurs. And maybe this was meant to be a sort of sobering reminder that if you get too trashed, you know, your Centaur part will take over and then uh, someone will have to uh, apply some sort of order to you. And I, I'd like to think that in a lot of cups you see at the bottom of them references to Dionysus and you see references to the battle between the centaurs and the lapiths. So that might be another way. The other thing that this comparison of the two vessels show is we see a figure ground reversal. And what I'm talking about in terms of a figure ground reversal is in the Francois vase, you see that the background is actually red and that the figures are painted in black and then they would use an awl or a some sort of sharp metal object to scrape out some of the details in the faces. But in the vase here that we see with this by the foundry painter, which is more or less from 490 BCE, which is around the same time as the rebuilding of the Acropolis, we see that the, there's a figure ground reversal where the background, the black is used as the background and they would paint in uh, the background and they would leave the red clay as the color of the figures themselves. An interesting kind of also element to this is look how naturalistic and realistic the anatomy of these figures are. And even the centaur is slightly foreshortened where, you know, there's a little sense of depth where he's rolling over onto his back. And if you look at the shield, that's actually an almost a, an accurate elliptical form of something moving back into space. There's lots of Kylixes uh, that depict similar kinds of scenes. And I just wanted to show you a couple from the Stanford art collection that I photographed while I was there. And you can see uh, in the left hand side that there's a, uh, a creature fighting a man. And again, that idea of a half beast creature like a minotaur fighting a human is this battle between, for instance, bullheadedness and, and rationality. And in the case of the centaurs, it's slightly different. It's, you know, the, the sort of uh, wild horse-like nature of man. This vase by Andocides is called a bilingual amphora because we're looking at one side and then another side in this. And both sides depict the heroic warriors from the Iliad, Ajax and Achilles. And uh, you know that you have an Achilles heel and that's how Achilles was, healed at, was killed actually. But Andocides is this scholar or is, is not, Andocides is a potter who painted equally well with the black figure and the red figure style. So we have from 525 BCE, just before the other pot we looked at from 490, this depiction of this depiction of two scenes in which you have a black figure style and then a red figure style. And this is a transitional vase that shows a uh, sort of movement towards realism 
or uh, illusionism. And that's kind of an important idea. And remember, we talked about Ernst Gombrich, that art historian, who talked about that as schema and correction. Well, uh, my theory is that as we move through time in certain cultures, that often when the diagrammatic or communicative aspects of the art are less important, they actually become more decorative and they get more involved with illusionism and realism. I'm going to look at a vase by a guy named Ezekias, and I like the close-up of this because I think it actually shows some things that you need to know about how vases were painted. So this is a black figure vase in the archaic style. And if you zoom in on a, a little bit, you can actually see that the figures are painted in black. And the way that they did a lot of the diagramming or detail was that they used a metal awl or something that looked kind of like a nail. And they actually scratched out the details. And you can see the details on the leg and the face where they actually scratched out some of the, the ornaments and details in that. And that's called scratch. Graffito or graffito, uh, which is basically where we get our term graffiti from. It's just basically a kind of mark making that's done after you have applied the glaze. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about with you is that almost all of the vases that we are looking at that concern the depiction of male figures often have to do with them as being heroes and kind of a, a um, this relates to the heroine a little bit, but also the idea that you want to emulate these guys. And when you depict heroes, you want to make sure that people know the stories behind them. So you might want to pick up the, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. If you find that kind of reading excessively boring, you can always just look up synopses of the story. And another way to get through some of those stories might be to actually go to your library and see if you can get an audio book and just listen to it while you're driving to and from school and see if, if you can memorize the story or learn the story a little bit and some of the, the events in the story. Because I think that... All of those things interrelate and that there's a connectedness between the things that you learn in your lit classes and the things you learn in your art history classes.